Okay, now I have the pleasure and honor to introduce to you the creators of Deutschland 83, the screenwriter Anna Winger and the producer Jörg Winger. Let's give them a warm welcome. And Jörg, you get your own mic so that you can talk on top of each other. That's important. So I, I wanted to mention that uh, we really want to thank the um, uh, Creative Europe uh, Desk Sweden and the Eric Pomme Institute for helping us getting these guests here. So welcome to Gothenburg. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So you, you came from Stockholm this morning because you were in Stockholm being interviewed for Babel Bio, which is the new show about film and yeah. TV. How did it go? It was amazing. This is not on. We, we thought we were in a, a TV show. Oh, it you should just have it closer to your yeah. mouth. It's, oh. Yeah, it's on. We also had the great privilege of meeting your Minister of Culture. Oh, yeah, she is amazing. Us. Yes, that yeah. was thrilling. And, uh, She's very yeah, popular with foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> in Cannes, everyone was like, I met your Minister of Culture. Yeah, she's pretty impressive. She's amazing. Impressive yeah. person. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then we, we saw the last uh, 30 seconds of episode four, actually, when we came back to our hotel uh, of Dodge and 83. So that was oh, like, very exciting. That's nice. It's like a band hearing their <laughs> song for the first time on the radio. Okay, so I guess a lot of people in the audience are familiar with your show. It, it aired, um, started airing on SVT here in Sweden a couple of weeks ago in, in January. But I thought maybe we should start with watching a trailer and this is kind of a specific it it's trailer? kind of a specific yeah. yeah it's so it's five teasers for five different territories because this is a show that really has traveled yeah i, I put this together be, uh, last week for um, for a different conference because i thought this is um it's interesting to see how different uh, broadcasters have seen our show and what they made of it and what they emphasized yeah so let's take a look at it and then then continue the discussion and i think Maybe we get up and stand on the side so that people can see better. Der kann das. Und er hat das passende Profil. Sind Sie bereit, der Partei alles zu opfern? Natürlich. Nicht. Auch Ihr Leben? Sag mal, was ist hier eigentlich wirklich los? Niemand darf wissen, wo du bist. Der Westen wird uns angreifen. Und weißt du, wo uns das führt? In einen Atomkrieg! Defcon 1. Dein Land braucht dich. Deutschland 83, die Ausnahmeserie. Ab dem 26. November. Deutschland 83, 12. Januar, Ertan. A l'époque de la guerre froide, Berlin, à l'image de l'Allemagne, est divisé en deux blocs. Berlin Est et Berlin Ouest. Deux systèmes politiques, deux doctrines opposées. Au milieu de ce panier de crabes, un jeune espion qui va embarquer pour la mission du siècle. Comment ça Quelle mission Ton pays a besoin de toi. Et vous De quel côté êtes-vous Deutschland 83, votre nouvelle série inédite à partir du lundi 11 janvier sur Canal+. The greatest evil is not done now, but it is conceived and ordered in well-lighted offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth-shaven cheeks. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. Yeah. 
the hit German spy thriller, Deutschland 83, coming soon on 4. This June, learn to pick locks, learn to use microcams, learn to read text upside down, learn the brush pass and love it, embrace another culture, become a good listener, dress to kill, get the girl, plant the bug, crack the code, hack the system, keep friends close, keep enemies close, eat, sleep, brush pass, read between the lines, dodge bullets, meet new people, become the brush pass master, remember what side you're on, watch your back, become a spy, save the world, no pressure. Deutschland 83 premieres June 17th on Sundance TV. So do, do you have a favorite one? Deutschland. <laughs> you like the German one? Uh, no, I, I like the British one, my best, I think. I don't know. Oh, I, uh, I don't know. I, I think I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's so hard to say. I think it's so interesting just to see it. Um, the, we, I just told you, uh, for, for example, the French are the only ones who show one of our main actresses naked, uh, naked for a second. Which is something that she was very, uh, she really didn't like it, and uh, but there was nothing we could do about it. Um, <laughs> you know, that's not the only difference. I think it's pretty self-explanatory <laughs> between the trailers. <laughs> but you can, you could probably a uh, cultural an anthropologist would probably have fun. So we should uh, leave it to um, yeah. the woman who gave the talk. Yeah, analyzing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. The, the cultural differences. Okay, so the series is about the divided Germany. Obviously, 83 is the year when it's, it's happening east-west, and uh, uh, it's a guy from the Eastern Army who goes to the West as a spy. That's like the, the, the basic of the series. How did you come up with that idea? I mean, you're both uh, credited as creators. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wrote it and he produced it, but we yeah. created and developed it together, yeah. and uh, we're, we're married. Um, not that that's relevant, <laughs> but it is, we it kind is. of worked on it all the time. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we, we had for a while been talking about doing something together. I'm a novelist, and my husband has um, been making a really popular crime series in Germany for... Um, Solcom. Yeah, he's yeah. made, like, more than 320 episodes of it. So, yes, uh, it's a, a big. it's been a big project in which he's experimented with many different kinds of uh, storytelling, and, uh, you know, it's gone on for such a long time, and it's been great. And so we had talked a lot about, we were really inspired by Scandinavian TV, actually, uh, to do something the, together. Yeah, this, this would not have happened, mm -hmm. the, all this international traveling, without the uh, door opening of the, for, of the Scandinavian minds. drama. Yeah. Of, in our minds and also in everybody's minds, uh, the idea to put a foreign language series on a, on a and channel. Yeah, this was the first German language series on, on in, America, America, in America, right? And in yeah. England, really, mm -hmm. I think. And but I'm not sure about Sweden, but... But in terms of creating the show, you know... Um, Not in Sweden. We've had a lot of... Chances. Yeah. No, uh, in terms of creating the show, you know, the thing about um, a short, like a eight-episode, ten-episode season like this is it's a lot sort of conceptually like coming up with a novel. I, I totally agree. I didn't catch the name of the woman. Who Tatiana. Just, yeah, Tatiana. I totally agree with what she said about... I mean, it was uncanny, her description mm -hmm. of, of how it works, because that's really how we work. But... Um, it's sort of containable, uh, and we were really inspired by Borgen, uh, mm. a Danish TV show. And after that, we started talking about how we could make a show in Germany that would be that would use crime dramaturgy, but be about something else. Mm. You know, so it's kind of a marriage of. Um, okay, so you uh, came genres. from that, and then well, you came up. Well, with well, 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 we came. came also. We came also from uh, one story that was floating around in our heads for mm. a while. Um, mm which is based on my experience at the, in the West German military in the 80s when I was uh, basically listening to the Russian troops in the GDR um, and taping their conversations. And uh, they would sometimes uh, communicate back to us um, and ca call people out by name. So we, uh, we knew that we had some kind of mole on the base, and that's a story that we have uh, discussed a lot amongst ourselves, and we always thought, well, what kind of story could that be? And then Anna had the genius idea of um, telling the whole story from the perspective of the mole. Mm. And that's basically how we started. But you know, we were really interested in the 80s in general because we live in Berlin, and to our children and to young people in general, um, 
the whole idea of the divided city sounds like science fiction, mm. and it's and it's not that it's not that long ago. It sounds like, like a fan fantasy right? premise. Yeah. Like, what if they <coughs> built a wall and you couldn't go to Mitta for lunch? You know, um, it all sounds like we made it up. And um, when our our daughter came home from school once, when she was seven, and she said to us, you know, there was a wall, and we said, <laughs> where? And she said, right here in Berlin. <laughs> And we were like, what happened? And she said, they knocked it down with their hands and then everybody hugged. And we were like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So um, we, we had- And David uh, Hasselhoff yeah. sang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So, That's what uh, happened. <laughs> it, it, you know, it was really fertile ground. There hadn't been a really exciting German adventure. Um, I think maybe as an American, I come to that sort of thing a little bit differently because we tend to make patriotic projects <laughs> and uh, there hasn't been a lot of patriotic German projects. Um, I'm a foreigner, you know, obviously I really uh, like to live in Germany and uh, yeah, so that was the, but we picked 1983 and I think this is maybe uh, part of the theme or I'm not sure how you would call it, but um, <laughs> in part because it was a year that German pop music traveled around the world and it had was this kind of Nin very... No, 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 Luftballons, yeah, right? And, yeah, and also uh, the Peter Schilling song, uh, Major Tom, which was a riff on the David Bowie song. You know, there was this connection between German pop culture and the world that year that was really special. And if you look at the top 100 of 1983, you know, all the songs are memorable. It's incredible. It was just this crazy moment in pop culture. No, 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 it's a uh, That's also really interesting because it, it has, and that's something that dawned on me. I while think it's we were, playing in one of the scenes in the first Yeah, it's episode. in the first yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it always plays somewhere in the first episode. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, interesting thing about this is that it also has, it contains the theme of the show, uh, one of the themes. Sorry, it's so funny. It was just going to be apologizing. <laughs> it's hard to live up to, uh, <laughs> Tatiana. to Tatiana's talk. <laughs> well, we're trying, um, and um, so it, it, it is about a mis, among other things, uh, about a misunderstanding that almost leads to World War Three. Right in the song, the '99 red balloons are mistaken for missiles. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of thing happened, actually in 1983, it happened twice. And we would, all, we would not be sitting here today if um, those two misunderstandings, nobody really wanted to attack, but they felt they were about to be attacked. I, I think that's also something that resonates with today's fears. You know, how much do you fear something and then how does that make you act mm. towards that fear? Um, and th that's that's the theme of non Luftballons, and that's also the theme of our one of the themes of our show. Mm. And you grew up in America. How did you go about uh, uh, researching this world that was back then? You, I mean, you never visited, I guess, East no, Germany. No, and I, weirdly, I lived in Mexico in 1983. But but I'm I'm half American and half British. But I've been living in Germany now for 13 years, mm. and um, you know the great privilege of writing about the 80s. You know, it's not World War II. Like everybody's still alive. Yeah, you can. So there was beat, beat, lots yeah. of people to talk to from politicians. I mean, of course, I spoke with politicians um, and people who were, at, you know, in the Stasi and in the BND and in the CIA at the time, but also just normal people like all of our friends and family because everybody remembers it. You know, there was a lot of details that came from, you know, one of the one of the. I, I mean, this is kind of a cute story, but you know, w when we first started researching this working on this project and talking with people about how how afraid they were in, in the 80s like if they how they felt about nuclear war on different sides and i really agreed with something that she said i guess michelle king had said about the good wife that you know one of the great things as a writer about uh, uh screenplays is that you can represent all different sides of the equation mm. you know so we always said um you know when we were doing this that no one is evil on our show everybody is doing this um because they believe that what they're doing is is the right thing and is making the world a better place. And that was, all of our characters are coming out what they're doing from that perspective, mm. whether they're working for the East or the West. And, um, you know. And that's hard to uh, maybe um, realize from today's perspective, especially for younger people. But in 1983, there were still a lot of people who thought that socialism might be, you know, might be winning this Cold War in the end, so. So, uh, Jörg, you're not only a producer that has produced 300 episodes of Soko, you're also, um, you lecture on the development of drama series at Film Academy Baden-Württemberg. Uh, and you said you developed this together. Yeah. So how come you're still married? 
No, it was pretty cool, actually. I mean, <laughs> people always ask us about that as if it's really strange. We had never worked together before. Over yeah. the years, I had written a few episodes of his show. Yeah. Like, um, but that was different because there was a clear hierarchy that he was like my boss. Mm. Uh, on, and it was definitely writing to his show. Yeah. It's a different thing to write. And now it was to your. To someone now it was it was we were it was doing it shared, together. It was a shared vision, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, well, it's it, you know we got to know each other uh, again. I would say uh, over the course, we turned our house into you know a writer's room, and uh, yeah, it was um, it was intense at times. Uh, but I thought I think it was a really great experience. I can only recommend it. Mm. We're being interviewed, actually, by this woman who's writing something about this, and she had just uh, interviewed um, the Kings. So I'm, I'm really curious to read the interview, because I would like to know what it's like for them to work together, because I guess there aren't that many. They're also married, married yeah. couple. Yeah, the yeah. people who make the good wife. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the actual production. Um, how did you go about doing... Did you have a showrunner? We kind of shared Were those. You? I mean, it's... One thing is, we. I was really interesting to hear what Tatiana had to say. First, I wrote this, the pilot on mm -hmm. spec, and I truly believe that a pilot is the opportunity that you have to sh to create this world. Like the pilot is the novel, the pilot is the everything, you know. And you have this chance to really create this world. And then, but from from writing the pilot to finishing shooting was only 12 months. So for I started writing the pilot in December 2013, and we finished shooting in December 2014. So in that time, and then we had a small writer's So you room. got a green light really fast after yeah. doing the It was pilot. an it was unusual great. situation. Yeah. It was really, and I think this um, project was blessed in that respect because from the beginning, everybody we asked if they wanted to participate in the project. Um, and who are the main participants? Well, creatively? Uh, no, or money wise. Well, money wise, yeah, yes. So RTL yeah. is the main, is the, is first the broadcaster. Yeah. They came on board very early because they they trust Ufa Fiction with uh, with our track record. Um, they know us very closely, and um, so they we had that advantage. But they also really in the in the first meeting in the room, they thought, oh, this is you know because our audience, and this is probably true for most audiences. They're in their 40s and fi people watch TV nowadays, linear TV, and their 40s and 50s, and they were young back then. So they immediately RTL immediately understood this is something where you can travel back in time, mm. not just in the stories but also in the music. Yeah, and it's, the nostalgia it, factor. It takes kind you of. back. Yeah, it take, I mean, I guess everybody <clears throat> who hears certain songs from the series is can't even help it, but he's immediately taken back to that time. And um, so that was very clear. We got a green light for eight scripts. Uh, we hired four writers. The whole writing process took place in English. Um, I translated the scripts back into German, did another rewrite. The, the director came on board, um, was very crucial in the visual development uh, together with his uh, cinematographer. Um, and. Also, this, I mean, this has to be said, I think that uh, here we can, um, I, I, what I really appreciate is the, the German uh, craft and all the different heads of departments. Mm -hmm. I think the production the design. design. I've never and been to East Germany, but it looks very detailed and correct. Yeah. And our costume designer also. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing, I mean, in terms of show running, I think we were, you know, we speak each other's language, but we write in different languages. So it's, it was very good to work together in that way. We, um, but there, it was just such a, it's a small constellation of people who work together and share a vision and everybody was really operating at the top of their game. I mean, it was an amazing, it was an amazing collaboration across the board. Like with both, we had two directors, um, two cinematographers, and then one head of set design, uh, one costume. And, but it wasn't a lot of people. And also there was our person from RTL, the, um, her name is Uli Leibfried, I don't know what you call that in, she was like our supervising producer from the network, mm. so our network exec, I guess. Um, she she was in the room with us from uh, after the pilot. Like once we f started writing the series, she was in the room every day. So mm. we never got notes um, from you know from afar. It was we, everything was very, you know, we were all very intimately involved with one another mm. the whole time. And we were able to do. In the end, yeah. we 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 when we watch the series now, we feel this is. Yeah you know, what we wanted, what we wanted. at mm. the beginning. So it's the, I think in, uh, I don't know, in, in, in Denmark, uh, it's called One Vision, right? 
I mean, and that's not, you can't take that for granted in a German TV series. You know, there's... Well, in Germany, it's usually very separate. No, no, there's the, the, the problem usually in Germany is that you have the broadcaster who will, um, who will give you, if you're lucky, uh, one set of notes from one person, and if you're not lucky, you will get um, notes from five different people. And, and in what positions in are those people? Yeah, that they are that, allowed to yeah, give notes. Then. Well, yeah, they are <laughs> often in the in they feel or they are in a position um, that they have the authority to not just to be in charge, but also to be in control. So, you know, I think this is changing now because people so have. Is this your experience from Soko that it's no, a lot no, now? No, Soko was also for different reasons. Um, we're able to do. Um, what we want at uh, Zoko, I wouldn't have been able to stay on that show for 300 episodes mm -hmm. uh, if not. But um, I think um, I don't want to complain too much. I think that German broadcasters are now beginning to understand what it takes. Um, there's one crucial thing missing: is the way we treat our writers. Is uh, there's no real creative and financial incentive for good writers, good uh, TV writers in Germany to create new series. The ideas and, and don't usually come from the writers. Please ex expand. Yeah. So the, the ideas don't usually come from the writers. It'll be more like the broadcaster says, okay, we need like a, a funny crime show for six o'clock on Thursdays. And then there's what, like a gangbang, which is like when everybody in Germany comes up with an idea like that. And then all the production companies pitch them. And then they pick like three. And then those three write, I don't know, pilots or okay, something. Okay, so they order specifically this yeah. slate. And we and need to find the people between 35 and And it needs to take place in Baden-Württemberg or wherever. Okay. And so it, or Bavaria or something where the funding is. And then it, so it goes like this. That, that's just generally how it works. And it's not, there isn't the culture of writing spec scripts. There isn't the culture of, of writer-driven ideas. And, and that has to do with, I mean, yeah. Anna's right. From the broadcast perspective, and we have a very limited range in genre. And again, that's just beginning to open up. ZDF has uh, started to make some series that are different now. Uh, RTL has done Deutschland 83. Um, and others are following. We see there's, there's a, it's definitely changing. Um, but for the writers, it remains true that um, it's a huge risk they take when they develop a new show because instead of writing for an already existing uh, successful show, mm -hmm. they will take a financial hit and they will have to explain uh, their family you know, why they don't get dessert for mm -hmm. you know, the next year. And then if the show becomes a huge hit, they won't participate in the success because they don't, they don't uh, participate in the financial success. Mm. So, you know, it, it's... I think it's just financial. I think it's that writers aren't... The thing about long-form television uh, series is it's really a writer's medium because you're taking these characters and you're sending them on a journey and you don't know where it's going. Like, you know what it's about, but it, if it's going to keep going, it's going to keep... It's this, evo it's this evolving creature, the story, you know? And these people's lives are like real people's lives. They just keep going, you know? And... Um, Traditionally, German TV is a director's medium, so like the writer writes it and sends it in, and then it's taken over by a director, and then it finishes, because either uh, there's procedurals, which go on for a long time, which are usually the province of non-writing producers, not showrunners. Um, York's show is a little different, but traditionally in Germany, they're just non-writing producers sort of shepherd them along, mm -hmm. and each episode is kind of worked on by the director who directs it. Or they're uh, the, sort of the kind of really high form of German TV is all TV movies or like mini series, which are like say three times 90 minutes. And they don't really have the time slots or the audience developed to watch ongoing series the way they watch them here or in America or England. So people don't tune in like that to a horizontal storyline. That's just not the tradition. Because they're just not trained no, to do it. They watch yeah. three times 90 minutes, usually three days in a row. Like it'll be like Thursday, Friday, Saturday or something. And they'll watch three times 90 minutes and that really Usually, although today here you're going to see a really unusual example for German TV because it's different directors, but usually those are directed by one director mm. so that it's like, say, you know, three times one director, one person's vision, and the writer is very secondary to the process. And they're not even there. No. They just give the script. Give the script. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's true. And it's um, because, but you said because there's TV. There's a change coming now. There's a change definitely Why, why I mean, now? Well, I mean, well, you you know you know the series that are now currently being produced. You watch them. 
I think that... Um, but not, they're not writer-driven. I mean, I haven't seen the writer-driven ones. <laughs> Please have some kind of <laughs> dispute. Well, Weissensee <here. laughs> was clearly uh, written by Anita yeah. S. Yes, and, but she was then thrown out. I mean, I'm sorry. It's, yes, but she it's was. Not true. But she was. No, she, was right. she wasn't even on it the second season. I know, but the first season was so great because she was in charge. Yeah, she wasn't in charge. But you know, there is a change happening. <laughs> It's good you stick up for the writers yeah, here. No, you know, I speak up. I, I, no, I speak yeah. up for the writer uh, because that's that's and we agree on this. This is the missing link in German television. Mm. It's the, the the position of the writer, um, and I think I think that German broadcasters are coming around to the idea, but it's not as natural for them to be on a stage like when we have. Let's say somebody from DR in Germany, and, he, and a broadcaster gives a talk. They say the writer's in charge. You know, it's the writer's vision. Or somebody from HBO says, you know, we're the gallery, and the writer uh, or the creators come in, and they exhibit their art in our gallery. Mm -hmm. That's you know, we're quite far away from that. Um, that in, in in Germany, but we're getting there. But mm -hmm. on a, a practical level, like not even about the ego thing or anything. I truly believe if you don't have some a writer who's burning to tell a story to follow a series through, it isn't going to be very good. It's it's a, it's as simple as that. Like it's a crazy job. You work on it all the time. You dream it. You sleep it. You drive your husband crazy. The whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's you're thinking about it all the time. You're, and for me as a novelist, you know, it was my first experience working so closely with actors, and that was. For so me, you were on set. Uh, and before we did read throughs also yeah. before, and we worked with the you know the casting and like finding you know. For me as a writer, that was a kind of miraculous relationship because you're so close to the characters in your head and then you meet the actors and they're just as close to these characters and that's this incredible extension because as a novelist, you know, it's, it just ends with you. Mm. And then when you meet the actors and they bring these characters to life and they're, you know, the guy who plays Schweppenstetter, who's one of the heads of the Stasi, I remember when we first started talking about the character and we had like many long lunches discussing the character, he was like, you know, I feel like he lives in a really messy apartment and he never washes his dishes. And I was like, I mean, you never see this guy's apartment. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe you think about that. Like, it was amazing. So I think, you know, you have to have people who are just fully invested and, in, um, yeah, just from a practical standpoint, the writer, it makes sense that it's the writer for an ongoing story, but that, you know, that's not the way things are done there. It's it's also interesting now because I'm working in multiple countries to see how it's done in different countries. And um, I definitely think in England and in America, uh, there's a lot more understanding of the role of the writer and kind of respect for that. So it's, mm. it's definitely, they start from a different place in the conversation with you when you're developing an original idea for US mm. or UK broadcasters. Mm. Well, when we talked about the reception, how the, the audience isn't, trained to see things that aren't 90 minute the mini series how has the reception for Deutschland 83 been in germany it, it, you, do you want to take this difference? sure yeah is, so is it a I question you want to avoid uh, <laughs> no 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 no, no it it was uh, i mean if it was so new no, no, the, did people understand it or? well the, the okay here's the pr problem uh, um rtl was fully on board and they were amazing partners throughout the development and the production of of our show However, um, it was they took a huge risk because they knew they were making something that their audience is not used to and is maybe their core audience is... It's not even aimed at their core audience. It's as if you make a show for NBC, but it's actually an HBO show. Mm. And, um, and, but they were willing to take that risk. They knew it also. They were not surprised by how it looked. And, um, of course, we were all hoping that you know, in addition to all the critical success and everything, would also have 20 million viewers. Mm. Um, is that what is considered super good in... Uh, yes, are. that they would be... That's the World Cup final. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Because it's uh, like... 40, four million. It would 44. be four million... How many people? Four million. 80 million people are living. Yeah. 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 That would be pretty good. Yeah, that would be pretty good. Yeah. Four million uh, would, have been, would have been very good. Mm. Um, Unrealistic expectations. And, yeah, I think the first two episodes, we... I mean, uh, it's it's getting too much into details. He I think there like were this. some. Okay. It went it went down to two million on free TV. But what what's important uh, to know also is that five or ten years ago we were able to watch a program in a certain certain time slot 
at a, on a certain channel and the next morning we would know how many people have watched it because that's the only place where it shows. Mm. Today, uh, and with our series, people were able to watch it on RTL Now, on their uh, on-demand service, then they were able to watch it on Amazon, they were able to watch it on iTunes, mm. they were able to buy the DVD or the Blu-ray, they, they were able to uh, download it Ill illegally, and all this, we, we, uh, this is what I call the new intransparency in, in television. We simply don't know how many people have watched our show in Germany. Mm. And then, uh, I hope now it's going to be a little bit more positive. How was the reception in the States? It was really <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, my parents got to watch it on TV, and it was also... Um, no, but I mean, it's a big no, it thing. A it's the first German language yeah. series. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was like... It, it, well, I also have to say one more thing about the German thing, which is that they marketed it as something very dark mm. and um, very uh, ernsthaft, you mm. know, serious. And it, it didn't really communicate, the marketing didn't really communicate the other elements of the show or maybe what made it special. So that was kind of a disconnect. But I, they also didn't show it as a series. They showed it in 90-minute chunks. And it was written, shot, edited, made as a series in 45-minute episodes. So it was, it was definitely a misfit in the way mm. it was broadcast. That was kind of complicated. But in the US, where it was shown as a series and it was a real surprise hit, I mean, it was on a very small channel um, that doesn't have a huge audience. It wasn't on ABC, you know? But it was on Sundance and they took a big risk. They'd never, they've only shown one other show even in a f with subtitles, which was um, Les Revenants, this French mm. show, yeah. zombie show. And then they showed our show uh, the next year, and um, they'd never shown a German show. And, you know, when I first got together with my husband, you know, and if I said he was German, like, the Nazi jokes would just keep on coming. <laughs> it was really, like, very unpopular, Germany. And when I first moved to Berlin, you know, people were like... It's courageous. And now everyone knows yeah. it's the best place like, in the world. I don't world. know if it really requires courage, but okay. <laughs> and, um, and now people were so interested, and it was such an amazing experience to be both in England and America. I, f I feel it's been an amazing experience how interested people were, how connected they felt to the story, to the character, to mm -hmm. our actor, how much they liked him. So that was, that was all really fun. <laughs> I think the perception of Germany has changed dramatically, at least in the US and, and I guess in England. So that definitely helped us um, with this show. Yeah, and the perception about Berlin is, Berlin. at least here in Syria, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. almost 10 years now that it's yeah. the coolest city in the world. Yeah. Um, so, like I said in the beginning, the reason why we started thinking about doing this focus was your series, and, and, and people are like talking about the rise of quality in, in, in German series. Do you agree that it's happening? Why is it happening now? And do you have some other series that you know about that are coming that you could maybe recommend that we keep a lookout for? I could talk about Familia Brown, can I? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a friend of ours has made a, um, a really unusual web series. It's only five minute episodes. Mm -hmm. um, he made it for ZTF. Again, they took a real risk with that um, because it's about neo-Nazis and it's, about, it's a comedy. Uh, and it's about neo-Nazis. Sounds like a good paradox. <laughs> well, and you know, in Germany, it's a big deal to make yeah. a comedy about neo-Nazis. And it's about um, a young man who basically had sex with a woman from um, s somewhere in Africa. I, I can't remember where she's from, like six years ago when he was drunk. Mm. And she shows up on his doorstep and says, I've been deported, here's your child. <laughs> and he's like, my friends can't know, like, oh my God, I have a black child. And it's about... <laughs> his relationship with his child. And it's really funny. And one of our daughter's uh, friends from school actually plays the child. And uh, and what's it called, the series? It's called Familia Brown. Okay. And, um, and it's... Familia Brown. It's, yeah. No, it's, it's a, what's amazing about the show is like you laugh, you feel truly horrified by part of it. And, and I, I cried in part of it. And it's only 45 minutes, the whole show. Mm. You know, it's these very short episodes that could have been much longer. It's, it's not like a, watching a, um, you know, there, it's not all these little snippets. It really feels like fully realized episodes. And the, um, the characters are amazing. And the acting is amazing. And it's, it's very moving, mm. even though it's funny. And it's about something pretty gruesome, you know. So 
I thought that was a real radical departure and they're gonna show, it's also radical the way ZTF is showing it because they're releasing it online. I mean, this is very smart because young people do not watch TV at 8.15 on whenever. They're, they're, show, they're releasing it first online in its entirety and then they're showing it after um, the news, a news a magazine show on um, Friday nights, um, the, the, these short episodes. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of both audiences will get a chance to see it. And I thought that was, uh, that's something mm. coming down the pike that's pretty special. So maybe you can say something about, uh, do you think this is going on, the quality yeah. rise? And then do you have some recommendations? Um, yeah, I, th I think it's coming. I think we have, uh, you know, some, th some things to change, as I explained mm. that before. Um, we, we at our production company at Ufa Fiction, we're trying to change it from within because we, um, what we also don't have, we don't have strong writers unions in uh, in Germany, so that's missing. So the writers have really have trouble to negotiate their deals. So we're trying to create deals for writers now at our company that will attract those writers to devote more time. Okay, so to it's their systematic changes actually. It's, that yeah, I we're trying needed, to yeah. change the yeah. System yeah. from within. Yeah, the machine has to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. I, I truly think that. But people want to do that. People want to do yeah. it. Once, once they get, and, and this might sound banal, but once they get the money um, so that they can devote the time to those projects, they, they, are, they will be, they are willing to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have, I th I'm curious about two things. One, one is from our own company, uh, which is a hospital, little show from the 1880s in the Charité, the world famous Berlin hospital. I think that's going to be very exciting. And then I really Does it look have forward a title? Sorry? Does it have a title? It's called Charité no, right now. It's the okay. um, working mm. title. And then uh, that's maybe the opposite of um, what, what Anna was talking about in terms of budget um, and length. Uh, it's the uh, Berlin Babylon series yeah, by Tom Tikva. Yeah. Mm. I mean, everyone's we, uh, looking yeah. forward to been, that one. Yeah. We have been waiting for this for yeah. years. Um, <laughs> they took more time in the script process, which I don't blame them. Uh, you know, everybody should take more time. What, what, where in the process are they now? Uh, they're you about know, to shoot now. Shooting in April. In April. Yeah. Okay. And like two months ago, there was a rumor that it might not happen because somebody from the broadcaster said on TV that um, turned around to his colleague and said, is this show really happening? I don't think it's happening. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then Twitter blew up and everybody in the industry thought, oh my God, mm -hmm. uh, because they were already building these huge sets in Babelsberg where they recreate the Berlin of the 20s. Oh. Um, and I think we'll, you know, we'll see something uh, amazing, probably, mm -hmm. since the people this who I'd love to bring. Opportunity now for kind of, uh, I don't know what you would call this, but international shows also, because it's not, I don't think... Everything has to be simply a German show that takes place in Germany mm. or a Swedish show that takes place in Sweden. I think uh, uh, there's interesting hybrids that are kind of coming up. And maybe something like Narcos has been such a game changer because it was, yeah. you know, 80% in Spanish mm. and no one cares and people watched it anyway and it didn't matter. You know, people in Germany were watching it in Spanish. Mm. And um, I think that opens the doors to different kinds of you know, where this, it's all about character, so it, it shouldn't all be about country, mm. right? So. And what has been very inspiring, I think, to both of us um, throughout the last 12 months when we went to different uh, festivals and talked to a lot of people who are in this business of making TV series, is that uh, there's a, now a global audience uh, out there, and they don't um, care where, the, where it's coming from, uh, where the series is coming from. They, they're ready and willing to dive in to any world, and uh, it turns out to be an advantage to uh, tell stories from a part of the world that hasn't told their stories mm. in this kind of format. So I'm, you know, hugely optimistic that uh, this is becoming a much more globalized industry, with uh, people, you know, co-producing, co-financing, co-writing, all kinds of amazing stories mm. um, within agree. the next few years. So one last question: Will there be a season two? Uh, to be... Uh, to be continued. <laughs> I don't know, you know, for the moment we're focused on other projects. It has not been commissioned. Can you say anything about the other projects then? Yeah, I, I'm writing a show now, and this is sort of an interesting example. Uh, it's for BBC America, which is owned by AMC, so it's an American broadcaster. It takes place in Berlin, 
It's a family drama and a thriller. Um, it takes place in current time. Or, yeah. Contemporary, which it is, takes place in Berlin. Yeah, which, which, which is great because I think we, uh, I mean, I, I told you this, the, the series that I look forward to, they're all historical and we mm -hmm. have a real bias toward historical drama, in so Germany. I think it's really about and time. I have a craving to write something into which I can sort of incorporate things I think about now. I mean, of course, historical things, you're always writing about the present anyway, actually, mm. as a writer, but whatever. But the point, what was interesting about what I wanted to say is uh, the broadcaster is not so language specific. Like, they don't care if people are speaking German in half the show. And I think that's a really interesting distinction because, like, working for RTL, they wanted even the people at NATO to speak German, which is, so like everyone who sees our show is like, why are they speaking German at NATO? Did they speak German in it? It always comes up yeah. like every time. And I'm like, no, but that's how the broadcaster envisioned it, you know? Um, and that's a little bit, uh, I think that at least for me, I like to watch things true to language and it makes it, 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 it you know, it contributes to the authenticity of a, of an experience, uh, even if it's science fiction, mm. you know? So um, so th this show will be in English, but also in other languages when, when people are speaking And does languages. it have a title? Uh, no, I, I can't say the title yet. Yeah, not it's even funny, a working actually, title? actually, weirdly, I thought I wasn't allowed to talk about it at all, but then I was at C21, and the head of BBC America talked about it on stage, and, and she like, started okay. describing it, and I was like, that sounds good. They're making another show in Berlin, and then I was like, oh, that's my that's show. <laughs> it was really weird, I, because I just thought it was a secret, so I just told you a little bit. Um, anyway. So we got to stop. Yes. we got to take a break. Thank you so much for coming, Anna Yargi. <laughs> <laughs>